Assalamu alaikum viewers and listeners of the Inspirited Minds podcast. Do join me on this episode where I'll be speaking to Hanif Bobat. He is the Director and Business Development Manager of Ethnic Health Forum, which is based in Manchester. Uh, we spoke about his personal experience with manic depression, which started in his early 20s. And we also had a chat about how that led him on to developing a career within the charity sector, specifically in the mental health arena. And we also spoke about parenting. I do hope you find this episode useful. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, is it okay if I call you Hanif? Yes, yes. Absolutely. Okay, um, Hanif, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, in Spirited Minds podcast today. Um, it is obviously virtual, um, but hopefully we can, we can make something good happen here. Um, I'd love you to just introduce yourself, tell our audience who are listening and, and perhaps watching as well who you are. Um, yeah, take it away. Jazakallah, salam alaikum salam and Jazakallah for the, offering me the opportunity to share my lived experience of mental health issues, that's a huge topic in itself. I've always been an, uh, a proactive campaigner to kind of work to destigmatize mental health. But anyway, we'll talk more about that. But thanks for the opportunity to, to have this conversation with you today. Uh, I'm Hanif, I live in Manchester. I wished we were not in the COVID situation. I'd love to have traveled to London to do the interview and I love Sahara Grill in London. So yeah, I'm in, I live in Manchester. Uh, I was born in India, actually, uh, in 1957. I've, I've kind of been in Manchester now 30 years. Uh, my parents migrated from India to actually East Africa, well, Malawi, in Central Africa. Uh, so I always use example to say I kind of triangulate within three continents, India, where I was born, uh, Africa, where I grew up, and Europe, where I live. So it's kind of a triangulation of three continents. And I always say to people when I'm having conversations to say, yeah, I may be born in India. I live in Manchester, grew up in Malawi. But I see myself as a global citizen. So that will put things in, in kind of some perspective. Uh, in terms of work at the moment, I, I mean, yeah, I, currently I'm working for a small charity based in Manchester um, called the Ethnic Health Forum. I'll go into that later on, but I've had a quite a varied career in terms of uh, in terms of uh, in terms of working in Manchester and other places, so I've worked in the charity sector for well over thirty years now, in different roles uh, within NHS as well uh, as kind of policy officer in the old Manchester Primary Care Trust. The NHS structures have changed, so I worked in the NHS. Then I worked in uh, international charity called TB Alert, which was working around. Uh, 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 reducing incidence of tuberculosis in the UK uh, as development officer for TB Alert for the Northwest region. And then I worked for another quite a well-known charity in Manchester called Black Health Agency, which worked around sexual health, HIV, amongst other issues that they were tackling, and most currently with Ethnic Health Forum. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, uh, kind of work-wise. Um, always been involved in working around mental health issues from very early days. My first job actually was in mental health uh, and I'll come to it later on. Uh, yeah, because you know, that's going to be a, a kind Thank of you for, component. Yeah, that was a really comprehensive kind of um, start. So perfect. Thank you so much for introducing yourself, letting us know um, in terms of your roots, where, where you were born and where you grew up and, and that you've lived in Manchester for, for 30 years now. Um, it would be great to hear a bit more about the lived experience that you mentioned. So I wonder if you could delve into the lived experience of your mental illness, how that started, how, how it developed, or was it more of a sudden thing? Can you tell us a bit about that? I, I think that happened in my kind of early, early 20s. Uh, I never realized it. And I think on hindsight and on reflection, it's one of the issues that is always on my mind. 
and it's about how can I share my experiences so others may hopefully learn some lesson or hear my story and perhaps say actually these are the things to avoid or you know could be a trigger in my case at that time I did not know but when I was diagnosed uh, I was diagnosed with cannabis induced psychosis in those days I never knew what mental health is anyway so everything this was new cannabis induced psychosis okay I listen here and took it out doesn't make sense to me but uh, later on obviously you know I was uh, I was uh, treated with lithium in those days lithium was the first line of treatment mm -hmm. um, alhamdulillah you know with medication and I always say and I always my kind of belief is always you know I mean I speak a number of languages one one being Urdu I always say dua or dua prayers and medic medication especially in relation to mental health issues someone who's suffering lots of people say well I'm, i don't need medication or you know i think there is a role for both faith and medication along in terms of i'll, I'll talk about about that later on but yeah in terms of at that stage when i went through i was not aware what was happening to me i was high i was manic literally manic i was doing crazy things absolutely crazy if one was to listen uh you know that's another project in itself in in kind of working in terms of writing about my experiences from that day till now you know inshallah one day it might be published you know uh, in and terms you, of the whole story around you at the time so at, at the time when when this actually happened who, who was around you who was your support yeah I, this happened whilst i was in malawi actually uh so i was my parents were around me um uh, but to an extent i was a kind of a, a, a i wouldn't say a lone ranger but a lost soul if you want to use the terminology so yeah i mean i was with family uh when the incident happened uh so i was hospitalized and uh, in those days there wasn't uh in malawi it was a very just a small developing country in fact even statistically today malawi has only two or three psychiatrists in the whole of Malawi. So you can imagine, you know, there wasn't proper treatment care. Uh, and uh, so yeah, I was hospitalized in very basic, you know, it was more like a room, mm. you know, there was no medical facilities. Uh, and then a friend of mine suggested to my dad to say, listen, Mr. Bobat, I don't think Malawi is the best place for your son to be in. I think you need to go to the nearest nearest place was Johannesburg, South Africa, where I could see a professional for help. So my dad actually flew me, took me to Johannesburg. We flew within a week of this incident happening. Now, whilst I was still in a manic stage, uh, very hyper, very manic. So anyway, uh, Johannesburg, you know, consultation with a uh, psychiatrist, you know, and then put on first line of treatment, which was lithium. Uh, and that took about six, eight weeks, actually, you know, for for the medication to work. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, in those days, I wasn't aware what was happening. So I was, I was manic. I was doing, you know, as now learning over the years in terms of what, you know, what one goes through mm -hmm. on hindsight. Yeah. You know, so if you are high, you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, you have grandeur delusions. You know, I had one of those classical symptoms of manic depression or, you know, religious delusions that, you know, you're communicating with God, you're getting messages from, from God, from Allah. You know, I mean, there was an incident, you know, Lao, I now laugh, you know, in Malawi, in, in the kind of, in our, in our lounge, we had uh, on, the, on the wall, we had the kind of, most Muslims have, you know, kind of a big carpet rug of, the, of Kaaba, and we had a small table in, in, the, in the lounge. And I was circumambulating, circu, what's the word? There's a kind of word. Walking around it. Yeah, walking around it. And, and I was manic. You know, I was thinking I'm performing Hajj. Yeah, I was in Mecca. So, I mean, that's the level of my manic, you know. Obviously, for me, many years later, I mean, there was a connection for me about this incident and my, and my, and my drive and my steer towards spirituality or faith. 
and how I have used faith to recover on and make mental health my career, okay. as you know, we will discuss later on. You know, yes. uh, I have two questions um, about the the kind of um, explanation that you gave there about your lived experience of mental health and when it initially happened in your twenties. One is, did you relapse after that experience? And the second is looking back now, the diagnosis that you received as cannabis induced, was that indeed the case looking back now? Was that the correct diagnosis for you? Uh, a very good question. I think not. I have always challenged that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I know it exists because cannabis, you know, a lot of cannabis uh, smoking in your teenage years can get you to that stage. Uh, and I've had this discussion with, you know, psychiatrists in the UK in the last 20 years, many a times to say, well, fine, okay, that was a diagnosis. Great, I was given lithium. In my own mind, I still think there were other factors leading to that. Mm. You know, and, and I always say, I think part of it, my learning has always been, is about uh, not getting the right support from your peers, from family even. You know, you're not allowed to do what you... You know, I was very creative. I had fantastic ideas, but I was always kind of, you know, criticized or not supported in my ideas. I, I personally feel that that's a small contributory factor as well. You know, uh, not on its own, but I think constantly putting anyone down, anyone who has creative ideas, obviously then you might go into, you know, in my case, obviously, you know, smoking cannabis was an outlet, but I think it wasn't the only reason why I was, you know, I went, I went, I went manic and diagnosed manic, manic, manic into you know, with manic depression. So I think there was a combination of factors. Mm. Uh, I feel, yeah, I think quite, quite strongly that when one is not allowed to express his or her ideas, vision, and do what they want, then the individual may drift into other avenues and then that can lead to other things you know psychological ill health could be one of those mm. and i'm deliberately trying to now change the wording from mental health to psychological well-being because it's it's a constant challenge we all face you know having worked in the kind of industry uh, uh, if i'm drifting on your original You're question please, please 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 uh, because i think unless and until we challenge the word mental illness. And I think that is quite a policy driven, influential. We cannot overnight change this because it involves the Royal College of Psychiatry, one. It involves the government, it involves communities. The fact that we use mental illness or mental health, automatically it's kind of negative. Mm -hmm. So partly I think I will talk about our work at Ethnic Health and we are deliberately trying to remove the word mental health mm. from our vocabulary. So mm. even our posters don't mention mental health, mm. we say psychological health. And unless we start using this more and more and more, mm. it will take probably another 20, 30 years to educate, to campaign. So it's not something we can get rid of the word mental health overnight. So anyway, that aside, uh, uh, so that's part of the kind of overall work is, you know, you're working within within services, within health services, you know, you know what you're doing, even though my work directly is not related to mental health right now, it's always there at the back of my mind because we see clients who have, you know, an unemployment issues, housing issues, psychological issues. Mm -hmm. So we are kind of, you know, we are living with this, with psychological uh, issues all the time. If not me, my family, my friends, my community, how we tackle it is is a major question. We all, you know, we all of us are actually thinking and working towards how we actually uh, tackle it. The issue around your question is whether, uh, so yeah, so that that episode and relapse actually there were incidences after that many many years ago. And I think what I've learned is I've learned to recognize the signs or symptoms. Mm -hmm. So when I feel that I'm, I'm getting hyper and now this is not even while smoking now. So I'm not, I quit smoking 
many, many, I mean, I quit cannabis maybe 20 years ago, you know, soon after that incident, mm. you know, which happened, you know, I did smoke on and off later on in my maybe a couple of years, you know, but now I'm talking into later years in my thirties and forties, when I felt that I'm going a little bit manic, mm. I've kind of learned to manage it and say, actually, I've kind of understood that process and said, actually, I'm doing things too fast. Mm. I need to step back. You know, if I'm not careful around what, around health, around what I'm doing. So yeah, there was a constant kind of, uh, there was a constant button to say, actually, I need to be careful. Uh, am I, am I correct? Am I kind of going into manic stage? Yes. Am I correct in hearing that you understood yourself better over the years? So, and Absolutely. in that you gained clarity about, um, asking yourself those questions about how am I feeling, where am I going, and kind of caught things before it went to that manic stage. Um, but I think that's quite remarkable. And I don't know if that is doable for everybody because are you taking med medication or, or, you know, the 20 years that you're mentioning now, were you still taking medication? No. And I think that's one of the kind of, you know, interesting, uh, interesting areas of call it medicine or in terms of treatment or, you know, how you recover. Uh, and I work with many friends and acquaintances over the years who have relapsed many times over. Mm. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, you know, by the grace of Almighty, I haven't relapsed to a stage where I was that seriously ill, mm. you know, and uh, I always see that as a blessing for me, you know, to say that major experience impacted me so much that has been constantly on my mind. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, in my case, there wasn't a major relapse, but I was always conscious of it. I was always conscious of the effects of cannabis. Mm -hmm. you know, even in some later years, I was a fact, I was always now more aware to say, actually, if I did smoke, it might just take me back to that manic stage so always cautious and say actually no i don't need to have this you know maybe there are other other areas where i can get naturally high uh, rather than have uh, substances which will unnaturally make me high mm. so yeah i mean i would say you know partly uh, i've been lucky fortunate you know allah's will that i never relapsed and then in, in, in combination with that, it was knowing yourself, because you mentioned things like stepping back. Um, you mentioned other sources of getting that adrenaline feeling. So what were the things that helped you in your recovery? And is there things that you do at the moment that help you stay on this path, basically, of... of um, good psychological well-being and, and maintaining that. And I'm glad you used the word psychological well-being. Uh, you know, if we try and, you know, the more we kind of take it out of our kind of thinking, thinking cap, uh, which is difficult because we live in a society where we keep using the word, you know, I don't want to use the word, I'd rather use psychological well-being, which is great. You know, you kind of, the more we practice, the more we get rid of, that vocabulary, you know, uh, starting with M. So yeah, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, strategies, I suppose one thing that I remember vividly is during my illness, uh, my parents, my father, late father, bless him, was always with me and always praying. Because when I was on lithium, I was gone. I was, I think all I did was sleep, sleep and sleep, eat and sleep. And I put on so much weight, I think I would probably put on maybe 20 pounds in weight over a period of six to eight weeks, because all I was doing was sleeping. And, and I think that I was shocked and surprised in later years to see how manic I w was. You know, it took me at least six weeks of rest, just medication, wake up, eat, sleep, eat, sleep, and doing nothing else. And all during the time, my dad 
was with me, you know, during the six, eight week period. Uh, you know, he left the business, you know, in the hands of my sister and my brother back in Malawi and was with me in Johannesburg, you know, for this period. And I kind of vividly remember him always, uh, you know, making prayers. So I think that was quite a strong factor. So in terms of recovery, I think it wasn't just me. It wasn't just the medication. I think it was a higher force behind the recovery, you know, which is faith, not mine. Could be my late parents' prayers, duas, and others as well, you know. So I think it was a combination of factors. So medication, yes, helps, you know, in, to an extent, yeah. you know, and we all as Muslims believe that, you know, shifa is from Allah. You know, you can have the best medication in the world, but if it's not to not men, it's not, you know, you might have the best drugs in the world. You know, I've seen many cancer patients survive and recover, you know, with very little drugs. And some have been given the best drugs, latest treatments, but, you know, they haven't survived. Mm -hmm. So I think as Muslims, as a Muslim, I always kind of reflect on the bounty of Allah and thankful all the time. Uh, in my mind, I'm always, you know, and I think one of the lessons I've learned over the last 20 years or so, or 30 years working in the field of health and psychological health as well, uh, is the concept of, uh, of thankfulness. You know, uh, Urdu, we might say shukr. I don't know what the word for Arabic, probably similar shukr, you know, but thankfulness, you know, always, always, always be thankful for whatever you have. You know, it could be a small piece of bread, you know, and it's always on my mind, you know, to say actually when I have a piece of bread, I'm always thinking of the millions who actually haven't got access to the small piece of bread as well. So I think that concept of, uh, and I think this is all connected. They are all of this are interconnected in your well-being, mm -hmm. you know, and in your recovery. Um, I'm not sure whether I answered your, your yes. first question. Yes. Partly I did. If, yeah. I'm, if I haven't, please just remind me again. No, of course. Um, so yes, it was all about your recovery and what are the things, the practices, the ways that you maintain your psychological well-being. And, and you've mentioned your faith is a part of that, the fact that your father was praying and his du'as and the people around you and their du'as helped you through, as well as that you're practicing thankfulness and continuing to practice that. Um, but are there other strategies that come to mind and um, things that you notice in yourself uh, that you bear in mind now, apart from the ones that we just mentioned? I think one that kind of springs to my mind is, uh, uh, and, you know, I hope that, you know, Allah gives me desire to make my prayers more, more regular. I'm not a regular kind of, you know, uh, mosque or, you know, that's part of my weakness and I'm trying to kind of improve on it. But, uh, I think meditation and reflection, you know, sometimes just I've found going, going to the mosque, just spending, and sometimes I go into a mosque, not necessarily just for a particular prayer. The reason behind that, okay, it might be time for Maghreb or Isha or Asr or Zohar, but in my mind, that is what takes me there. But there is an, another reason behind that is I'm really there to get some time off and kind of connect, you know, so my, you know, so because, so yeah, it's kind of a dual, dual purpose. So yeah, I might go there, but my, my mind isn't there on the actual Salah. My mind is somewhere else. I'm really going there for a bit of solace, a bit of peace. You know, when everyone's gone away, I sit for 10 minutes or 15 minutes on my own. Everyone's gone. Mm -hmm. For me, that's the quality time for me and my creator. So I haven't gone in for a prayer per se, you know, obviously Allah will judge on that. I think it's the 10 minutes of quality time that I'm just there reflecting on myself and, you know, you know, and, and part of it is forgiveness is kind of seeking forgiveness and obviously prayers for wellness, you know, prayers for well-being for everyone, you and your family, your friends. So I think that type of uh, practice I'm, I'm not perfect, but I still try and do that even now. So yeah, I mean, that kind of brought me back in the, 
in the kind of, and I think I just wanted to highlight to say, you know, the importance of faith. And there is one story I remember. I used to work in mental health services as well. Uh, unfortunately, I have to use the word mental health services because partly we are stuck with it. You know, we call group therapy, you know. I used to work in kind of in an environment where, you know, individual service users or patients were coming together, you know, meeting up and in a part of group therapy. And I thought, Alhamdulillah, what fantastic opportunity we have in the mosque. You know, I remember in Malawi in my young days, we used to sit in the mosque after prayers and the there was a leader and he you know he's you know he read the you know page of hadiths or stories in a group and i thought Ma, alhamdulillah this is group therapy we're doing you know this is yeah. eh? this is you know this is this is group therapy as we know in kind of psychological well-being you know you need you know peer support group therapy and i'm thinking actually you know here is a parallel to what we in the west believe in helping and group therapy i said we do it in the mosque in a setting which is which is peaceful which is conducive you know so yeah i'm just kind of you know bringing in different aspects no, you know perfect. so group therapy for me really worked another question um so one is when did you did you attend the group therapy yourself or was that part of your work as you mentioned something that you worked on this is later on as part of my work and part of helping others so it wasn't myself but you were also but it was it was kind of learning from all those years. And I think actually then trying to, and obviously uh, I like to read a lot. You know, I've read, uh, I, I do a lot of reading. I think there was a period eight, 10 years ago, me and a colleague of mine from London, we actually organized two conferences a year around psychological well-being in London. I think we've invited the top psychiatrist, you know, Professor Suman Fernando, Sashi Daran, the top psychiatrists and people in the field of mental health or psychological well-being. Unfortunately, I was having this conversation today with my friend in London. I said, listen, one of the biggest mistakes we did is not to save all that, all that archive, the material that we had all the, you know, every year we did two conferences around psychology and mental health, mm -hmm. you know, um, huge. I said, if we had that archive today, I said I could have shared it with inspired you guys and said to you, listen, this is a wealth of, you know, key speakers, topics. I still have a few, uh, you know, with me, but I think we lost that whole uh, gold mine of information. We had a website, you know, because every time we had an event, we put the, you know, the kind of uh, the title, the content, the abstract, key speakers. The uh, one thing I learned from this, out of this was that each and every conference we did around psychological health, mental health, we always, always had a service user or a survivor as a key speaker. So yeah, I mean, we give all the due credit to psychiatrists, psychologists, researchers, but alongside that, there was always a key person who shared his or her experiences on the platform. And partly that went towards kind of kind of educating and informing the wider public on the importance of getting somebody opinion and views you know so yeah you might be treated but then your experiences you know uh, are so so valid and important uh, you know I still remember one conversation with an eminent psychiatrist and he says Hanif you know I've spent 30 years in psychiatry I'm you know I've reached the top level in my field, but what you have, your personal experience, you know, I am actually, you know, you have, I, I respect you for that and your knowledge around your, what you are sharing with me and all things that I'm even sharing with you now on this interview, you know, and, you know, and lots of other stories and experiences. So this psychiatrist says, you know, what you have is worth untold amount of studying you know, because you are sharing your experiences how you recovered how you can perhaps help others you know uh, putting in strategies to perhaps not it to happen i mean obviously i mean that's another aspect i'm always kind of thinking you know we as a oma and we as a community we always mix mental health and mental illness you know, and I don't want to use the word 
but I think we have to for this purpose of educating uh, the public. You know, mental health is, we all st go through mental health, you know, stress, anxiety, a little bit of depression. Mental illness is slightly a bit on, in a different kind of uh, level, you know. Uh, serious mental illness needs a lot of help and support, you know, to recover. Mm. Most people will recover quite, quite easily with a mental health issue. You know, one in four latest statistics or one in six, you know, whatever it is, you know, we will have, we will come out of it. Mental illness is serious, I would say anyway, from what I've seen, you know, in hospitals and over the last 30 years working in, working in, I've visited many, many institutions around the world. You know, I've been to Istanbul, I've been to Pakistan, I've been to India, uh, I've been to Thailand, uh, visiting various mental health hospitals, institutions, and I've seen face to face, you know, uh, those who have been affected seriously with mental illness. So mental illness, I would say is slightly, and I think we need to distinguish the two. And I just wanted to make that point. No, I think that was very clear. Um, what it leads me on to is partly what you mentioned before about stigma and just going back to your own experience again. What was it like that initial period of the six to eight weeks and then afterwards in terms of your community and not just your immediate family, but the wider community around you and how they were towards you? Can you recall what that was like? Was there stigma towards you? Were you self-stigmatizing? Um, yeah, t tell us about that. Yeah, I think, uh, and I was kind of reflecting on this before the interview in terms of, I think, when you talk about stigma, I mean, in my case, I started with that, that particular time when the incident happened, uh, because it was new, you know, not many people were aware of it. Uh, and I think during the early phases, nobody really gave it much attention and thought around stigma. It was about how do we get Hanif well? Mm. You know, so that was a priority. Uh, I personally never experienced stigma in the sense that I know how stigma affects many people and families, communities now. But in those days, perhaps less so because there was less awareness. Over the years, I have also learned that perhaps we ourselves, we ourselves are partly responsible for the stigma ourselves. You know. Uh, Did you find create... labeling yourself as anything? Did it make the did did the experience kind of? I don't know. Lead you to question who you are and make you doubt yourself in any way or uh you know during your recovery was it kind of get up and go and get yourself a job or 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 how how did things kind of life seem after your the six to eight weeks that you mentioned in johannesburg how did things develop from there um I think after I got recovered, uh, I I think that episode kind of, you know, it, it was just like, you know, many, many incidents where you're not well, you get well and you try and forget it, you know, or you forget about it completely, you know. So it wasn't a major part of my, you know, it, it, it wasn't a major part to say, well, okay, I got unwell, got treated, that's over. I need to move on. But of course it remained, it remained. Uh, and I think partly, partly, I think maybe there is a kind of hidden stigma. You know, people don't talk about it. I have did realize this after many years. Uh, and perhaps that's just, that, that is a stigma which exists. Personally, in the beginning, I wasn't very open to talk about it myself in the beginning but subsequently actually when I then made the journey to Manchester and I came across an organization a group a self-help group and I kind of said actually this is fantastic you know here is a group of individuals 
sitting around the table having coffee and you know just just chit chatting and it you know it's it was a group set up specifically to support people with who've come out of some type of mental health issue or psychological well-being and i said wow this is fantastic you know i want to be a volunteer you know so i joined this organization and uh, this is going back 25 30 years ago and you're still in and your i think by that point sorry are you still in your 20s at that point? yeah yeah this is like 25 now yeah uh this is that kind of 25 20 26 yeah so i said yeah and as and i suppose that now on reflection i thought i always think i said perhaps this was a blessing in disguise that incident that journey to this organization a community center and seeing this group of you know individuals sharing experience and i said wow fantastic you know i want to be a volunteer and actually that became the first entry point for me into my career of psychological well-being or mental health you know and i and, and my career started off from those days you know so being a volunteer with an advocacy group it was an advocacy group you know where we you know i joined as a volunteer and then i became uh i i I think the organization advertised for an advocacy worker. In those days, you know, there was a post of advocacy worker. Very few jobs are titled today with the word, you know, advocacy worker. They are, but very few. So they advertised for a post. I did, I was volunteer for six months. They advertised and my manager said, honey, apply for it because I think you have the skills and dedication. Applied, got it. You know, obviously my role was to visit hospitals, the psych wards, you know, making the contacts, you know, like a liaison person between the professionals, you know, the social workers, you know, psychiatrists, because, you know, a lot of the individuals who were, who were sectioned or ended up at the uh, uh, mental health unit could not speak English or had difficulty communicating. And that's where advocacy, the role of an advocate became very crucial, you know. Uh, so, yeah, that was my kind of entry point into my career. Alhamdulillah, I'm thankful for this career that I've entered through this this particular group, advocacy and kind of you know entering into the field. I've made that a career and I'm kind of earning alhamdulillah fairly good salary out of and I enjoy it. So when I actually when I wake up and work in this field, for me it's a bonus 24-7. I don't see it as a nine to five job. I get a monthly amount, you know, you know, I get a salary every month i'm happy i never think of it as a job it's kind of you know it's who i am so for me i think that is the biggest bonus i think you know maybe allah wanted that for me do you think the um what you mentioned before about thankfulness and having gratitude do you think that's the single most profound thing that you learned from the experience that you had in johannesburg and you're, and you're diagnosed with manic depression, do you think that was the most profound thing that you learned or was there others? I think on reflection, probably yes. You know, I think one of the, one of the big lessons or big learning over the years last, from that incident to today is the concept of thankfulness. And say actually, you know, five, our five fingers or 10 fingers aren't the same. You know, uh, everyone, you know, and I think running towards materialism and money and becoming rich is a dream, is the kind of, is the world we live in. You know, everyone wants a fast car, a big house, everyone, everyone from a kid, from a kid to anyone young, everybody wants the latest designer stuff, you know, the best shoes for 200 quid, you know, Cartier watch, a Rolex watch. And I think, we are human beings, I think. That's, I think that's our default. I think default by God. God knows us very well. You know? He's created us. He says, let me, you know, I think that's the default. You, you wish for it, but then I, I'm the one who's going to decide what you get and what you don't get. And over the last 20 years, I've worked for you know, many organizations, you know, the Princess Trust and many employment support agencies where I helped young individuals come in access small grants and they've actually gone into businesses today you know i've helped them put the application their vision kind of refine their vision their idea you know help them with the business plan yeah they've managed yeah. to get a small grant 
alhamdulillah, you know, some of the young people are doing pretty well today. I think uh, which it's is so great. great to hear that you're really thinking about supporting your son in any way that you can and kind of relates back to what you mentioned a little bit about you didn't feel supported in your ideas when you were younger when you were very creative and I think other things that you said that really s struck me were how young people these days need to kind of be really thankful for who they are um, for what they have and also that kind of encompass with that they can become more grounded and not kind of keep looking at looking around them and comparing themselves to other people but actually thinking of you know being thankful for who they are and yeah just looking at their own path and their own journey more rather than comparing themselves Absolutely, and I think that's uh, you know that's uh, kind of learning not just for me, but I think for the wider, you know, in terms of the wider community. You know, we all, you know, we, you know, everyone likes material wealth, materialism. But I think it's 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 we all need to reflect our own selves and say actually, you know, we all have our own skills. We all have our own, you know, we all have our own capabilities. You know. And I think it's kind of accepting that situation to say, okay, if I set a goal and a vision, if I have in it within me, you know, somebody, young student has got the vision to be a, you know, go into medicine, dentistry, great. You know, they are determined and they do it. I know of a young man who was forced into medicine and had a breakdown in his third year at university. His father now, on hindsight, said Hanif, you know, this is this this is what's happened. I said, listen, you know, Mom, I told the, I told him he was, uh, he was a friend of mine. I said, listen, you forced him into it, so this is the result. So acknowledge your own. I said, you wanted that. My son's a doctor. My son, you know. I said, now pay for uh, not in a bad way. I said, because you forced him into something he wasn't happy to do. And that's the result that you get. So I think one is always to understand that, you know, and, and, and help your children, uh, the youngsters to actually develop whatever they want to do. You know, if they have an interest in arts or craft or something else. So, you know, if my son came to me and he wanted to be a carpenter, I said, great, go ahead, you know. I said, that's the skill you can use anywhere in the world. You know, be a good carpenter. We have many stories in, in Islam, anyway, in terms of about skills and, you know, you know, to be a good carpenter is a great, it's, it's a great uh, career. It's a great job, you know. In fact, carpenters earn more than me actually in Manchester. I know joiners who earn £1,000 a week. They are good at the job. Even professionals don't earn £1,000 a week. <laughs> you know, so alhamdulillah, you know, God has created us all with different skill set, you know. And he's thinking, appreciating those skill set and actually saying, I'm good at that and let's help support whoever it is you whether it's your family member obviously we are talking in terms of family in context you know your children you know my daughter alhamdulillah you know she wanted to study uni you know she wanted to psychology i said great go ahead did psychology i did say but you might not get a job easily she didn't get a job then she went on to do a master's in international business studies got a job you know so i said yeah with psychology you might find it difficult to get a job and she did struggle, she didn't get a job, then she did the second degree, and alhamdulillah, she got a job. <laughs> With the second degree, she got a job, but that psychology still helped her, it's still helping her today, but at least she pursued her interest. Mm. For me, that was the key thing, that she's happy, she was, you know, she was allowed and supported to carry on her study. I would love to delve now into um, your role in Ethnic Health Forum as a director and business development manager. Um, tell us about your role. How did the forum actually begin? Um, and what does the forum work towards? What is the motivation behind it? There's two twofold, uh, you know, we all have, we, you know, we all 
as human beings, including myself, we all are selfish. We want to create something. We want to create stability in our income. You know, so obviously part of it was obviously I need to do something. So, I mean, I joined uh, EHF about eight years ago or so, about roughly, roughly eight, yeah, roughly eight years ago when it was still a very small organization. Uh, I came in as a volunteer and then similar to that experience many, many, many years ago. I came in after my last job. I was made redundant from TB, from TB alert because, you know, three-year funding from Department of Health came to an end. I was unemployed for a year and a half. I had a little bit of redundancy bucks, you know, spent it within a year, you know, not a huge amount. Uh, and then got into EHF as a volunteer. And then I saw a huge potential there. And I said, obviously, you know, if I put the effort, you know, I will reap the rewards, you know, over a period of years. But obviously, I think what was good for me at EHF was I was, again, it's about allowing the individual to say, okay, you have the vision, you have the idea, just go and do it. You know, you have an open canvas. Obviously, we started off with small projects around health, you know, health, you know, health promotion, you know, a bit of small funding around cancer awareness, mental health awareness, you know, small projects around learning, training, education. So we were surviving for a first couple of years with small amount of funding, not a huge amount. Even I was working maybe part-time, you know, I was working full-time, putting full-time hours, but only getting remunerated part-time because, you know, there wasn't the budgets. Obviously putting in the effort with my colleagues uh, over the years, you know. So yeah, I mean, we have a vision, but we, we're still working towards redefining the vision in a way that is more meaningful. The last three years have been very nice, very good for us, alhamdulillah again. I always thank Allah, you know, because no matter what I, how good an application I do, if it's not meant to come our way, it's not gonna come. And I've seen that, I've written fantastic applications, you know, and we have not been successful. And I've done very bad applications. And we've been through, you know, with the Lloyd's TSB first stage, the last half an hour, we lost everything that we spent two hours, the whole narratives on the questions we were writing, it disappeared. I don't know what happened. We had 30 minutes to redo key points. After that, at three minutes to closing time, we submitted to the Lloyd's application. I told my senior, my colleague, I said, Rauf, we are not going to forget it. But Allah had other plans for it, you know. So can you see that, you know, we gave up hope. I said, we worked so hard for this application and then it just something happened with the laptop and systems. And then I said, no, I'm, I'm going home now. My, my colleague said, no, let's, we have half an hour, let's, just remember whatever we did, just bullet points. And we did bullet points on all the key questions, just bullet points, blah, 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 blah. And we said, submitted. We actually started off, we provide welfare rights advice. Mm -hmm. So we are a very small citizen advice bureau. Yeah. With a niche, we have the language skills. So we have four staff who speak Arabic, uh, Kurdish, Urdu, Spanish, and one other. Citizen Advice Bureau have those, but they can't, there's a waiting list. So we have kind of, we have captured a niche market, so to speak. And that's about how to survive in the current environment in the third sector. You need to have a niche, you need to have your evidence. So our strength at the moment is providing welfare rights advice to a lot of the newer communities settling in Manchester, a lot of uh, refugees from Syria, Iraq, uh, Kuwait and other countries, Horn of Africa. Welfare rights is our core USP, unique selling point. Mm. And Alongside, I've, we do a bit of employment support. Yes, I've noticed um, Ethnic Health Forum also have a section for women. Can you tell us a little bit about those projects? I think working, you know, working, we, you know, in, after a couple of years, uh, initially we realized that you know, as communities, we are all living together. And I think there was a gap in the organization, you know, to provide that voice and support for women who needed the support. So there are other groups, but I thought, you know, there was a particular need within 
the locality we work in. Uh, and alhamdulillah, we were fortunate in getting some funding from community fund. Uh, and we said we need to have a dedicated uh, woman in post who can start developing women's ideas, visions, projects. That's how it came about, you know, and it's about equality again, you know, in terms of equality, you know, we talk about equality and, you know, gender equality, man, woman, you know, uh, and I think that whole concept, so I think for me, it wasn't just the equality concept, but I think understanding my faith and the role of women within Islam, you know, if you want to be kind of use the terminology, you know, is offer that platform where they have their own, you know, they can, you know. So yeah, I mean, that, it, it, it basically came from that. So, you know, we had, we employed, you know, I think again, being creative, you know, so we had one, we had a post for one post, funding for one job for 30 hours, you know. We said actually one job, 35 hours, let's be creative. So we split that into 35 hours into four, into you know 10 10 hours sorry we had a bit of money left so we said let's employ three first so we employed three women with 10 10 hours yeah piloted it you know got some good results and then got some more funding in so we increased the hours so rather than having one job for one arabic speaking woman we actually have one arabic speaking one kurdish one urdu so between the three now and i would think the next step is if we are successful Hopefully, inshallah, we might have enough funds to get another woman in. So, you know, we have, we, we can meet the needs of different communities. And then, you know, there, there is lots to do you know, in terms of lots to do. And I think majority of the clients we get now at the moment, we have a fairly good, and my role is development. So my role is kind of thinking ahead, making the links with other third sector partners. So we have a you know, over the years, I've worked hard to you know, develop good links with other third sector charities. You know, so we have good links with GP practices, with the Sure Start centers. You will have heard of Sure Start centers around the country. So, you know, we have developed good links. Th those are our partner agencies who refer clients to us, mm -hmm. mothers with young children or fathers. You know, we have GP practices, you know, nurses, doctors who say actually let's send somebody for social care support, you know, because the doctors can write a prescription, but as you know, prescription isn't the cure. It's the other issues, individual needs, help around housing, income, support to find a job. So I think we look at health in a holistic way. Mm -hmm. So even though we have employment projects, volunteering, welfare rights, but I think if you kind of bring all those together is kind of working towards a i hate the word holistic health but that's what it is is how can we help the individual to achieve their potential you know, kind of very one sentence you know how can we make it happen for the individual for him or her to reach the potential you know it might be a long journey we can't resolve everything within ehf mm. you know but at least we enable them you know we we try and help them on the first two or three steps. We can't do everything for them, but at least we give them that first level of support. So majority of the referrals we get at the moment from job center are for universal credit. Mm -hmm. A lot of our clients who, are, who don't speak English don't know how to sign on. Mm -hmm. They have to log on to universal credit. Um, so getting them to that step, first step. Hanif, can people self-refer to EHF? Yes. And is that just through your website? Inshallah, inshallah, we are hoping we will have a new website up and running in a couple of weeks' time. Okay. Uh, we were again, alhamdulillah, again, God's been very merciful. We have received another funding this year to develop an app. To develop an app. So everything will happen on an app, like, you know, like WhatsApp, you know. So any, and, you know, nowadays, even someone who doesn't speak English, you know, uh, you know I had a lady come in the other day doesn't speak English, Mark, but she has smartphone. She uses WhatsApp. So I said, you can use the WhatsApp? Send me a message in Urdu or in your own language, yeah? I have a staff who will deal with it. Send her a picture of your letter you received 
from a GP, you don't understand what the letter is. Yeah. So we're going to use kind of the app as a tool to engage with clients and okay. try and help them. Yeah. Amazing. You know, uh, um, I, that kind of leads me on to just a little bit more about EHF and the kind of clients you work with. What's the demographic like? I mean, um, is the majority of the clients that are referred to you or self-refer and come, come and see you, are they of, um, you know, minority backgrounds? Um, are there any restrictions that you apply or do you help everybody that comes through your door? I think because of the, I mean, we are, we still consider ourselves a small organization. So we have to have some limits. So our criteria is very much, uh, we see our latest statistics which we submitted to Lloyd's Foundation. So the majority of our, uh, our uh, referrals are from our clients who, who have very poor English language, very, you know, hardly any English or very poor English. Majority are from minority communities. Again, you know, we all use the language BA. We used to say BME, now it's BAME, you know, communities, black and ethnic, black, black and minority ethnic communities. You know, but majority of the clients we see are Middle Eastern at the moment. You know, so the highest number of clients we have uh, are from the Middle East region, speaking Arabic, followed by mixture of Kurdish, you know, people who speak Kurdish language, followed by Urdu and Southeast Asian uh, subcontinent languages. We are beginning to get more referrals now from the Horn of Africa, from Eritrea, you know, so people who speak Tigri. So I think our next phase is try and get somebody uh, who speaks Tigri into our staff you know, who can manage that, uh, that caseload. So we have, you know, so those, kind of, those are the key clientele that we see really. I think that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Hanif, thank you so, so much for your time. It's been fantastic speaking to you. Um, and thank you for being so candid and, and sharing your personal experience from work to, to um, your psychological well-being journey as well. Um, I just wonder if there was anything else that you wanted to say um, to finish, any advice that you would have for anybody going through their own psychological well-being journey, um, anything that you'd like to say, uh, please do. I think one of the questions was what advice, I always say to people, follow my, I'm not saying I'm the only one, but follow a little bit of my, what I've done in my journey you know, to recover and, you know, it's, you know, mental health or the psychological well-being isn't for everyone. So, you know, I know lots of people who say, Hanif, I was ill, I've recovered. Thank you so much for your help and support. But it's not my field, you know. I'm a chartered accountant. I said, great, good luck. When I need you, I'll help. You. I need, I need your time to help me, <laughs> you know, but he doesn't want to talk about his illness, which is great. Everyone is not so passionate or not interested, which is fine. What I'm saying is there are people who may want to who may want to talk about their illness, their recovery, and say, actually, maybe it's something I might be interested. But I always say actually you have options and I want more people. I want more of our Muslim communities to come forward and say, actually, yeah, okay, it happened to me. I've recovered, I'm well. So what, you know? You know, psychological ill health or mental health. Okay, it's happened to me. I've recovered, I'm well, I can. I can follow a job, I can have a career, I can do things like other people can do. And I think that's the key message to say, don't be disheartened. Let's not stigmatize ourselves. Let's come out of it. Let's talk about it. Let's share the experiences and let's move on. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Hanif. I think a really brilliant note to end on. Um, thank you again so much for your time. and. I just want to wish you all the best with Ethnic Health Forum and everything moving forward for you and your family, inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you for your, for your time as well and for allowing me this opportunity to share my experiences. Hello again. Thank you for joining us on this episode with Hanif Bobat. I hope you found it useful.